Who is this? Greg. This is <clears throat> Crosby, Stills, oh. Nash. Yes. And Young. I just wasn't sure which flavor. Oh, if it was just Crosby, Stills, Nash? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Good music. Listen to those harmonies. Of course, uh, David Crosby just passed uh, earlier this month. Did you know he was Bing son? Oh, really? No. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I slay me. An, an icon, an icon in, in the music industry has passed, and, and you're making jokes. My goodness gracious. <laughs> I hope people make a lot of jokes when it's my times to go. Uh, we, we might even forget that you've gone. Who? Right. What? Who? All right. <laughs> Triple G. Listen, Di Dine Alone Records is going to suffer when you pass. The amount of publicity that you give them on your social media accounts. Free publicity, mind you. Um, yeah, you'd, you'd think they were a sponsor. Someday. Of this show. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> Anyways, rest in peace, David Crosby, not the son of, of Bing. Hi, the following podcast is brought to you by Radical Road Brewery, the best craft beer in the heart of Leslieville. Find him at 1177 Queen Street East. That's Radical Road Brewery. Anything you don't want to talk about? Like at all? You'll hang up on us if we talk about it? I mean, now you got me wondering. Is there okay, some no, there's... dark episode in my past that could be resurrected at a moment's notice? <laughs> The embarrassment of myself and my family and my loved ones. I mean, no, there's, no, there's nothing in like mind here. What is this show? What? <laughs> it's the interrogation. Welcome well, to the interrogation. Welcome to the rest of your life. I want the soft pillow. <laughs> my friend and I were writing all week long and just yeah. singing exuberantly. Were these heavy metal songs? Like, what's what's going on, Chris? Yeah, that's my usual forte, as you can find out. <laughs> <everybody> know. <laughs> Everything has a double kick drum. That's really this the foundation for it. Uh, there is a heavy metal version of Black Velvet that's pretty damn funny to hear. Is that the um, Christina Aguilera version? Yeah, yeah. She she went all Lita Ford on us one day. No, um, it was uh, who is it by? What were they called? Oh, the band was called Nail Works. Wow. And then on the cover of the record. There's a bunch of nails. I know. Surprise, surprise, right? Hello. And on the head of the nail was a picture of each band member. Huh? Oh. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. But they did the, you know, the black velvet and that little boy smile kind of thing, right? <laughs> it was <laughs> what, what, what is there a version? Is that the version that you you dislike or that you find the most interesting? I wonder if there's it, a, a, a it's the a, funniest. It's the funniest, okay. Yeah, it's the funniest version. Can there? I'm wondering because it's it's you know it's your baby. Is is there a version you don't like, or is it hard to? Well, I've been in a lot of bars where there's been some pretty dodgy interpretations. It's usually pretty funny what lyrics they get wrong. That 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 keeps it in the amusing category. All right. Uh, yeah. Do you have an example? No, because I I always blot that stuff from my mind. <laughs> <laughs> There've been a lot of versions, though. The, um, yeah. the There's a jazz band from Montreal that did a version, something like um, "Lost Fingers" or something like that. I might be making that oh. up. All yeah, right. that, that was pretty cool. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. 
so let's let's uh officially get started christopher um introduce yourself who you are um what you do or have done and then if you could end your intro with saying the name of our show welcome to the music i'm doing your job basically <laughs> yes you are you aren't going to introduce me, list off all my various accomplishments, alphabetized by... Important. Listen, your, your Discogs is 250 <laughs> items. If I were to like do a... Just for songwriting alone. Yeah, just for songwriting. If I were to do a and you, bio... And you, want me, you want me to do the intro. It doesn't have to be every single song or anything. Just, yeah. I'm Christopher, I'm the coolest guy in SoCal, and, and welcome to the music. You know, It could be something like that. Okay. Whenever you're ready. <laughs> Hello, I'm Christopher Ward, live from Santa Monica, California. And I, I miss the snow, and I miss my friends, and I miss my family, but I'm not there. Um, I'm here on Welcome to the Music. Welcome, 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 welcome. Chris, we're so, it's, so, it's so awesome to have you on the show with us. I'm really looking forward to this. Thank um, you. I, I want to say that uh, with the, with is, was it, I guess, a re-release or a release of Spark of Desire, uh, I just want to thank you for taking me back to my my seven, late 70s, early 80s self. I just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How was that early '80s stuff? Was he having a good time? I mean, I, I was. Well, when that was released, I was 11. So, so oh, I, <laughs> yeah, I was. I was enjoying. It. I was exploring. It's funny because I was actually starting to really explore music. My friend's older sister would make tapes, and we would, you know, right. share them and listen to them. And it was. It was. Uh, yeah, it was. It was a mixtape era, right? Yeah, it was. It was a neat time. So just you know, giving it a listen the other day. Um, in preparing for this interview, I just want to, you know, thank you for that. Uh, trip oh yeah, way. well you're welcome. I, I was actually really pleased with how it sounded. Um, luckily, we had uh, a, a stereo master to use to to do the the remaster from, which was great. Um, but also just the way it was recorded at Nimbus Nine Studios with Jack Richardson, who is the dean of, or was the dean of Canadian producers at the Juno Award for Producer of the Year is named after him. And he hired an unbelievable crew of musicians, guys like the Brecker brothers and um, Steve Ferroni on drums, who had played with Average White Band and was in Tom Petty's band for like 20 odd years. Um, the Canadian cognoscenti like uh, Guido Basso and Mo Kaufman. Mo and Kaufman, I was yeah. Just all these incredible people. It was really, really a mind blower for me as a young artist starting out to have all of this talent marshaled in service to my songs, and um, it was it was unforgettable. And I'm still grateful to this day. Hmm. Why why the re-release on 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 digital? Is, did somebody come to you? Was it something that? you wanted to do given the downtime of the pandemic? Uh, not the latter. My, my partner in crime on that record, Stephen Stone, who's my, one of my oldest friends, we wrote a lot of the songs together. And, and we, um, we'd always talked about this because it, it kind of just disappeared, you know? Hmm. It wasn't available on any of the streaming services. It wasn't digitized. It wasn't on CD. And people asked. I mean, I regularly would get messages online and asking about it. So once I by accident came across the stereo master in my storage unit, Stephen was like, this is it. It's a sign. We're doing this. So yeah, so we remastered it. And there it is. Nice. And and you know, going back to, to Greg's younger days, um, you know, putting putting that that album together it was your solo debut album um you know what was a young christopher ward thinking about in terms of your his musical career huh. well i was ambitious obviously i mean i wouldn't have made an album if i wasn't but 
um, I was still figuring out musically what my identity was mm -hmm. because the music that I made after that was much rockier, more singer songwriter kind of stuff. And then the, all the music that I wrote for Alana, I mean, those, those records tell you more about what I became as a, as a creative guy. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It, 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 so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up when you were recording that writing and recording that first album, like, and you probably get asked this a million times, but to me, it's just fascinating. Did, did you, did you know you had something that special there with it? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, we, the only thing that sort of gave us a clue that there might be something good was that the single once in a long time, which was the lead single came out a year earlier and it got a lot of play um, across the country. And it really established my career as an artist. Um, so it was the, on the impetus of that single that the album got made at all. So we did have some inkling, but no, otherwise, I, I, I guess the answer is no. Hmm. OK. And what, I grew up as a musician in Durham region. So mm -hmm. both Brent and Shirley Eichhardt were, you know, big people obviously out of oshawa in the music scene the late um, show, I, i'm sorry to hear of her passing yeah so we were just cream and i were just talking about that on the pre-show mm -hmm. um and and uh you know i think of i look at your body of work and i think of shirley's body of work um both amazing and the musicians that you've written for and played with and 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 um collaborated with um what was it like writing um, was it kickstart my heart kickstart yeah kickstart my heart with Shirley and 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 did you work on other projects with it I wrote a couple of times with Shirley I had I have enormous respect for her abilities as a songwriter and she was a wonderful person too who will be greatly missed in the music community um, the way that that song happened was kind of I think it's Alana who made that happen because Shirley played the song for Alana and she liked it, but she wasn't happy with the lyrics. And they, I think they, the original writers took a stab at it. And then Alana said, well, here's the story. I'm not going to record it if, this, if these are the lyrics, but if you let me fix the lyrics, you know, and so she gave it to me to do. So I rewrote the lyrics, but kept the chorus you know, the kickstart part. Yeah. And that's basically how that collaboration happened. Huh. Huh. It's just one of those stories, you know, every, <laughs> every song has, a, has a, a tale behind it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. When it, when it came to working on uh, Black Velvet and all the songs from, from that album with Alana, Alana Miles, um, at what point in time did you think, was there a particular song that you thought, you know, this is going to be the hit song, um, if there was going to be one? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, before everything blew up uh, for Alan and for you and, and really for Canadian music, uh, you know, across the border down south, the song was huge. Um, was there something that you thought that maybe there's something special here? Well... I mean, I was the chief songwriter, so I was just trying to create stuff that worked for Alana's voice. And Black Velvet is the classic example of that. I, mean, I remember bringing the idea to the writing session and she's like, that's mine. It was just, she just like <laughs> put her hand on it and, st and started singing it while we were working on it. And she just owned that song and it, it was, to this day, I get shivers thinking about her first performances of it. So, yeah, we knew we had a special song, but remember, it wasn't even the first single. Love Is, uh, one of the other songs on the yeah. record, was the first single. Um, and it was Black Velvet that happened sort of subsequent to that uh, in the U.S., and that's what broke it. Why that song? Have you, you know, as as someone who's a historian about of music, 
um why did that song translate i guess in canada you know you see it living down there when, when something breaks in the u.s that came from here like we get all you know we push our chest out we get proud of it um <laughs> yeah, like everybody knows that song um what was it about that song if I knew, I would have done it again. <laughs> <laughs> and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. You know, it's funny. I've interviewed so many songwriters. Yeah. I, I did a special um, for much before I left on songwriting. Uh -huh. And I got to interview some of the greatest songwriters in the world. I mean, people like Paul McCartney and Neil Young and, you know, just all these people. But they don't know. And in some ways, they don't want to know. They huh. just, it's like, don't mess with the magic. Just as long as it keeps happening, I'm happy. And I just write them the way I feel them kind of thing. And yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I mean, I guess you could put it under some kind of analysis to say, well, people generally like songs that do this and do that and do this, but I don't even know what those elements are. Yeah. You just sort of write and, and you know, whatever, translates with people is and gets well, you, picked up you're by not people. even thinking about the people no you're not yeah no you're thinking it's what gives me a thrill yeah what i mean i'm still to this day that's the the ultimate kind of you know uh litmus test for whether something works or not does it give you a thrill does it make you feel oh ah, i like that you know is there what's your do you still have a good relationship with that song and the reason I ask that sometimes, sometimes Question. artists will say, I, you know, people want the song when I play at a concert, I sing it over and over again, I'm sick of it. Do you have a, a similar relationship or, or is yours different? Well, I don't perform it, so I don't have a chance to get right. sick of one thing, but I can tell you that Alana never got sick of Black Velvet, probably because she could feel the impact that it made on audiences around the world. Yeah. And it's just, it's a connection between an artist and in, in my case, a writer. I mean, when I would see her do performances of it and see people's reaction and just realize how powerful an effect it had on them, it's humbling. It really yeah. is. And uh, yeah, I, again, I, I have only gratitude to, to express for that. Yeah. I mean, you'd think, I want to ask you another question about the song. You'd think that with the internet these days and, you know, you can, you can go online and see, okay, what are the lyrics? I'm going to do a, you know, I, I want to sing the song, but I want to learn it on guitar. Um, and, and I think if I'd gone to the lyrics years ago, I would have said, oh yeah, that there's a little bit of Elvis. They're talking about Elvis here. And that I think in the second, second verse or third verse, there, there's, there's reference to his song. Um, but it is a song about El about Elvis, or, or am I mistaken there? No, it is, absolutely. No, the reference is to Love Me Tender, which actually was a reference to the movie. Ah. And the impact that that had for his career. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, given an assignment of Much Music to go to Memphis, Tennessee, to cover the events surrounding the 10th anniversary of Elvis's death. So they put me on a... Greyhound bus with a camera person and 40 Elvis fanatics. Oh, wow. And we took the bus to Memphis from Toronto. And um, <clears throat> it was quite an experience, like following these people's, you know, trip through Memphis and all the stuff they went to. And the, you know, the fan base for Elvis is pretty damn dedicated, let's face mm -hmm. it. And to this day. And it was really a song about the phenomenon of Elvis from when he was a child, you know, the, I mean, his mother was the principal character in his life. She had the greatest influence on him and she would be literally, and he was, she was, a, I think a teenage bride. She'd have him up on her shoulder while she was sort of dancing around to mm. music of, you know, her favorite artist, Jim, a guy named Jimmy Rogers, the singing brakeman as they knew him. Okay. And, um, I mean, the other sort of insight into the song and its creation is that um, there was a writer who took a trip to Tupelo, Mississippi, which is where Elvis was born. And uh, for her research, she went to the church where he and his family worshipped 
and she saw the preacher falling to one knee, exhorting the congregation and just hallelujah time, right? And she went, man, that looks a lot like Elvis's stage moves. Oh my. And I read that and I went, oh yeah. And that's when I wrote a new religion that'll bring you to your knees. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So that's, those are kind of the keys to the song. Black Velvet, where does Black Velvet come from in, in the Elvis story? Well, that's a secret. Oh. It's just Greg and I here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you guys are get kind of loose-lipped sometimes, I understand, so <laughs> I'm going to hold on to that one. Fair enough. Drink some of, drink some more of that, uh, that green tea. Maybe that'll loosen your lips and you'll let us know. <laughs> <laughs> So it's inter it's interesting because you know we're talking about lyrics here, and um, I want to touch on your podcast that you have mm. um, with. Uh, um, sorry, is it blank. I'm joking. Here? Yes, thank you. Um, called famous lost words. Correct. Famous last words. Um, how how did that come together? Because it's quite fascinating as you go through the the the, the bodies of. It was Tom's like, idea. He does all the work. He came to me. There was a party in Roger Ashby's backyard one day. And Tom came up and introduced himself. And after we chatted for a while, he said, would you have lunch with me sometime? I'm like, yeah, sure. He said, I think I have an idea for us. I'm like, okay. Tom was producing the morning show, the Roger and Marilyn show on Chum FM for many, many years. Wonderful producer, brilliant archivist, loved, loved digging through the files for those famous lost words that we change into a program every week. And um, he digs through the, the, the recordings. They're on every format imaginable from like digital audio tape to, you know, cassettes and you know, CDs. I mean, everything. And he just catalogs it all and saves all the best bits. And then we weave it together into a show. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are thematic connections, but just as often as not, it's just, oh, here's a cool interview with Taylor Swift. Here's a cool interview with Elvis Presley. Let's put him on the same show and see what happens. Hmm. And um, so that's that's how that one goes. And, and it is so much fun to do that show because, I mean, all I have to do is yak, which I mean, you guys would understand, I think. No, I do all the work. I'm 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 Tom. I, I do all the work. You're Tom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Somebody has to be. That's, somebody has to be. Somebody, somebody has, has to be the Tom. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> what what changed? I, I'm going to go back to to Black Velvet. Sorry. Um, did you? I, I think you've talked about that the song changed your life. Um, if, if so, like how, like how did it? Was was it a huge change? Was it? Everybody wants to talk to Christopher Ward now and, and write songs for them. You know, what happened to you after the success of Black Velvet? Well, a couple of things. I had a lot more money in my bank than I did before. Mm -hmm. There you go. And um, I mean, I can't be you know pretentious about that and say it doesn't matter or it doesn't change your life. It does. And opportunity came to me, the opportunity to work with artists that I never in a million years would have uh, been able to sit down with. I mean, Diana Ross, I wrote with Diana Ross. I mean, you know, I wrote a bunch of songs with her. And uh, I mean, <laughs> something has to happen for, for that event to fall into place, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was an incredible blessing for me. It was, it changed everything about my life and my uh, professional opportunities. Do you ever, did you ever get starstruck, whether it's that much um, or whether it was, you know, getting invited to sit down with Diana Ross and write with her? Um, when, when were you the most star, starstruck and think, what the heck am I doing here? How did I get here? Leonard Cohen. Oh, tell me about that. I interviewed Leonard at uh, Much. And I mean, I had grown up reading his poetry and his novels. And I think I discovered the meaning of sexuality from Spice Box of Earth. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he was a powerful influence on my life creatively. And when I found out I was interviewing him, I was just terrified. Mm 
Mm. Is I had seen some interviews, and Leonard's one of those guys who doesn't suffer fools gladly, shall we say. Like, you better bring your A game if you're going to talk to Leonard Cohen, right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I was really, really nervous that day. But he could not have been more gracious and generous with his time and answers, and it turned out great. So nice. That's great. That was, I mean, that and when George Harrison walked in to much, I mean, when there's a live beetle in the room, you know, it's like the the air changes, as you can imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, One of the stories that I wanted to ask you about, if you could tell, um, I just read a quick bit about it was meeting Joe Cocker in a studio, I think. Is that correct? Am I correct? Can you share that story? It's a funny one. Um, it's the Steve Ferroni connection, who's the drummer that I mentioned earlier who played on my first record. Um, we were mixing Alana's first album at the Atlantic Studios in New York City. And um, I ran into Steve in the hall. He's like, hey, what are you doing? And I told him, and he, I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm working with Joe Cocker down the hall. He says, you want to come down and hear what we're doing? I was like, yes. You know, so... Uh, Alana and, and Dave Tyson, her producer, and, and, and Alana herself, and my, we went down the hall. And, um, you know, Joe looked over and kind of gave us a wave. And, you know, he's got a corona planted on his lap. And he was sitting in the captain's chair, right, sort of in the center of the studio, getting ready for a playback. And it was crowded. It was just a tiny little room. So I was literally standing with my hand on the back of Joe's chair as he was sitting there and they started to play back and it was a cover of an old Elvis song. There's a theme to this show. It's called One Night With You. And uh, it started and it just sounded so good. And I'm thinking, this is wonderful. And then I look over and I realize that they were just playing the track back. Joe was singing it live in the room. Oh and my it was, goodness. And it was just, oh, that's Joe. <laughs> you know and i'm standing like you know that was just it's i mean it's you know a moment because it happened but also just the way it sounded like when you hear somebody who is a certifiably great mm-hmm. singer mm-hmm. not just a good singer a great singer and you're standing there man you, you you just don't forget one single thing about it. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, thank thank you for sharing that. I know I, I read a oh, quick bit pleasure. about it, and that's why that's why I wanted to ask you about that. It's um, fun telling those stories, Greg. Honestly, yeah. it really yeah. is because you know it happened to me and a small group of people, and if we don't tell the story, nobody hears it. So exactly, exactly. So I appreciate that. Um, I want I want to jump towards your hosting and media um, career. Um, and I'm just going to forewarn you right now. My two one-year-old pups just came in from the backyard. So if you hear <laughs> barking and mayhem in the background, that's well, what if is. they do, I'll just bring my schnauzer hair in. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I, I wanted to go to talk about sort of you know, the launch of City Limits and how that came to be. Um, and, and the, you know, I, I want to get into the much days, but the sort of the impact of <clears throat> Moses and, and on Toronto and Toronto television and media in Canada. Do you mind sharing some of your thoughts around that? No, not at all. Well, it was the the idea of the brainchild really of two people, Moses Neimer and John Martin, who was the um, executive producer of um, uh, the new music show. And they created that together. And um, so when MTV was a success, and then there was talk about uh, a music channel coming to Canada. There was some serious scrambling going on as people tried to get the license for it, people like Rogers and various other, you know, eminences. And um, I think to a lot of people's surprise, the CRTC granted the license to Moses, um, sort of as the scrappy outsider. But also, I mean, they'd already been doing it. In a sense, they'd been doing it with the new music where, um, you know, like a few short years earlier, all you'd ever see 
of an artist would be, you know, like on the Wolfman Jack show or something, and they'd, they'd come out for, you know, 30 seconds and he'd go, wow, so that's a great song. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great song. Yeah. You going on tour? Oh, yeah. That's great. Okay. Well, listen, there he is. You know, and, they, and that would be it. Right. Well, the new era started and became more about kind of rock journalism for better, for worse, where, you know, people were taking a camera into the backstage area. They were going to the end of the studio to see records being made. They were going on tour on the tour bus to see all the bad behavior. And, you know, um, it was an insider's look at the music. And that I think helped to tee this thing up as much as anything. That plus the fact that we did the city limit show mm -hmm. um, and it was intended as a precursor to too much and i think those as far as i understand it those were the the most persuasive elements and then the reason why they got the license and so when Does that answer your question yes thank you yes okay. yes when when much starts did you think that it was going to be this huge six well, i don't know whether success but did you know that it was important when it when it started well sure because i mean if i'd been a kid at home and I knew about this thing called MTV that I couldn't get. Yeah. I'd be waiting in front of my TV wondering, okay, we're ready. Let's have it. Come on. Yeah. And when it arrived, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it looked different than MTV, but they didn't have the comparison point. Yeah. So we kind of got, had a chance to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we had a chance to make it what we wanted. And that's where, and also I should say that's a lot where Moses comes in because he didn't like old school TV. Like when it came to news, for example, yeah, he did not like the anchor sitting at the table with the telephone and just, you know, riveted to his chair, right? So he got that whole sort of free flowing movement of, of different, you know, the sports guy and the weather guy and the news guy, you know, all that sort of stuff going on. And a lot of that culture was moved into the world of much music. It was built to be loose. It was yeah. built to be seat of the pants. What are you going to do today? Television. And we were incredibly fortunate to have the freedom. And that was part of it. I mean, John was like, I don't know. He, he was sort of present and yet he wasn't. If you wanted to have a meeting with John, you had to go to the bar across the street, you know, <laughs> and, but it worked. He, he was laissez-faire, I guess, is the best term I can think of. But it, it worked because he hired the right people to do the gig, people who weren't going to screw up, who knew what was required and just went in there and did it. People like me and people like J.D. Roberts and people like, you know, the producers, Ann Howard and Michael, Michael um, Hayden, you know. Um, and as long as we didn't blow it, it was like, okay, <laughs> carry on, you know, on to the next day and, and do it again. And, and as far as having a sense of it being big, we knew that people were excited about it. And we knew that, you know, the sales department were getting a lot of calls to do advertising on it. And that, that you know, there was something building there as, in terms of a consciousness in the community. Um, but, you know, it's also just you become a fan yourself. You go, okay, if I loved music, wouldn't I want to see this every day? And that's, that's what yeah. happened. Yeah. Was your first role as a on-air on VJ? As opposed to? In the back as a producer or? Oh, <laughs> no, yeah. I never wanted to do that. Yeah. I never wanted to be a producer. I never had any inclination whatsoever to do any of the technical directing or yeah. any of that stuff. I suppose I probably could have morphed into a producer over time, but instead I became a songwriter. So, well, I was already a songwriter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so I don't know how much green tea you've had there, but we have, we have a mutual friend uh, in Erica M. So we were really oh, looking great. for some, like some, you know, juice or something that we could. Are we uh, looking for dirt, Greg? Is that yeah, what we're dirt, asking? If dirt, dirt, juice, dirt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can only say good things about Erica because I, I think she's absolutely brilliant. She's a wonderful human being. Um, I, I, it's funny because she she was chronically 
underestimated mm -hmm. right from the drop because you know the, the the rap on her was like she was the girl who was answering the phones in the background of the shot and all the guys at home went who's that babe right and that that's why she got the gig she got the gig through absolutely diligent hard work and she deserved every opportunity that came her way and she had a kind of light touch with her style on air let's say doing interviews and so on but you put her together with duran duran it's magic it's perfect yeah you wouldn't want i mean i was the serious guy you know i interviewed peter gabriel but they they don't want me <laughs> duran duran you know it would be it would be a waste of, of, you know, an opportunity for silliness. And she just made it happen. But I also saw her do some serious interviews too. I should, uh, I, I've told people about this one before. She got assigned Chrissy Hind and I was so jealous. I was like, fuck, mm. I wanted that interview, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, Chrissy was just her kind of classic irascible self. It's like, yeah, grumpy and kind of, why am I doing this? And you know, she kind of, she looks down her nose at you. But Erica just kept coming back and coming back. And eventually it's like she broke broke down, you know? Oh. And, and, and there was a really nice chemistry by the end of the interview. And Erica, she had to earn that. It's like respect, you know, it's not given, it's earned. You, you got to do the battle every single day with somebody brand new who already thinks you're, you know, turd on a stick usually mm. I mean the attitude towards the press by some of the rock and roll people was pretty abominable mm. what was your uh did you have a Chrissy Hind for you who was yours someone that was giving you the gears but ended up uh, ending well Jim Carroll is not a name that is well known in the music business he was a sort of an acolyte of Andy Warhol I think okay he had a band, the Jim Carroll band, and I think he might have been like a friend of Lou Reed's. He was definitely on the New York scene, and he wrote a book called Basketball Diaries. He's written a couple of books. Mm -hmm. I mean, he actually, he's gone. He died quite young. Did that turn into a movie, Basketball Diaries? Yeah. Okay. That yeah, did. Um, and uh, he came on the All Night Show. I don't know why he came on, because I could tell that he didn't want to be there. And... Um, you know, I was having a conversation with him and the all night show was so loose. The conversations could just ramble for an hour, which, you know, probably was not the best choice for making for riveting television. But, you know, what were we going to do? We had a chance to do it. And um, I can remember he was talking about the reaction to his book and he was disgruntled because everyone had compared him to um, William Burroughs because there was a lot of drug references and stuff. And it was you know in New York and so on. And I said, you know, I don't get that. I said, to me, it's more like Henry Miller, like Tropic of Cancer. And I'm a huge Henry Miller fan. And it was just like the veil dropped. And, and it was like I just hit interview pay dirt. He just was so grateful for someone making that connection and seeing his work in the light that he wanted it to be seen. Wow. That it was... As I say, this is a pretty minor moment for especially people that go home are going to go, Jim Carroll, who's that, you know? Um, well, you can look it up. Uh, but it was a cool moment for, for me and for him, I think. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you get to interview a hero of yours? A few, yeah. There were a few. Um, I interviewed Lamont Dozier when I was – this was not live on much. This was um, in L.A., he was one of the team of songwriters for Motown. Holland oh. was here, and Holland was the team that wrote all the Supremes hits, a lot of the Four Top stuff, Temptations, Marvin Gaye. Oh. They, their list of songs is just, like, breathtaking. And uh, I got to interview Lamont at his place. And it was just so great, him going, well, now, baby love. You know, we, we got the girls in. He's talking about the, the Supremes, right? He said, we got the girls in to sing it and it just wasn't sounding any damn good so i just said ah just sing baby 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 and then it's just like i'm going that's how that happened you know? <laughs> and it was you know again like lamont dozier is not a household name but to me mm -hmm. 
Mm. It's a god. And, wow. and the, 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 the capper to the story is that a couple of years ago, I actually got to write a song with him. So, <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was a pretty big moment for me. Wow. Mm. I can imagine there. Um, you know, sometimes, especially with Always On Media, um, I think to myself, man, we can't even have heroes anymore because somebody you looked up to, I was a huge Woody Allen fan. Okay. Um, you, and, you know, did some of the best stand up I remember. Uh, and then, you know, the issues with him and I go, damn, like, is there anyone that I could, you know, sort of fall in love with from afar as a star? I- I'm, I'm wondering, you know, when I asked, did you get to interview any of any of your heroes? You know, sometimes people say it's best not to meet. Uh, well, that is the cliche, isn't it? It's best not to meet your heroes. But I mean, George Harrison was, I mean, you know, I grew up the Beatles were the reason I got a guitar and why I started wow. writing songs and all of that, like so many. And um, I was nervous that day too, because the world had its eyes on me. It's like everybody was an armchair interviewer and boy, I had to, I had to carry it that day. Right. Yeah. Um, and there were some moments when he kind of ventured off and just like I did talking about Jim Carroll, he kind of ventured off into some really obscure stuff, talking about them using, like the tape head to create these backward guitar sounds that they would then use on uh, Tomorrow Never Knows and all this sort of stuff. And I'm thinking, I'm losing him. I'm losing him. Come on, George, come back. You know, <laughs> you've got to stay cool in the moment, right? Because it's live. And yeah. Uh, so that, that was that was pretty amazing. The, the funniest moment in that interview, well, there's, the, there's two. There's one that is on, got two million hits on YouTube where he talks about Paul McCartney. And I asked him, I said, so I heard that Paul McCartney was thinking of recording like some John Lennon songs. And he looks at me and he goes, what? And he goes, doesn't he have any good ones of his own? It was just like, <laughs> I went, well, now we have that on record. <laughs> he goes, oh, it's true, you know, <laughs> it's just a classic. I mean, the Beatle wit was just as much a part of the picture as the music, I think, but yeah. And then at the end of the interview, we get up and when they take the microphones off and we go over and we're, and we're surveying the room, which, you know, became extra packed because George was there, as you can imagine. Yeah. It, and it was, as somebody described it as they said, well, when George came in, it was like a church that, that day at much because it was just a hush over the room because nobody wanted to miss a single thing that he was saying and everybody was paying absolute total 100% attention to it. But as soon as the interview was over, it was like, so thank you very much, blah, 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 shake hands. Ah, the din, the full much din came back into effect, right? So George and I walk over and he's looking around the room and it's just chaos, like usual, right? Yeah. And he goes, this is a very casual program. I'm yes. like, thank you. Thank you for that moment. <laughs> I got my own private moment with George. <laughs> so, wow. That is so amazing. That's so awesome. you know, you go from George Harrison and the Beatles, uh, and Much was on for I don't know how many years was was Much music on the sort of the Much music that you started. How long did that last before they went to like game shows and? Well, reality TV. I mean, it was a gradual process. I don't yeah. really know because I, I lived in the States at the time and I wasn't really keeping track. Okay. Um, um, but it was, I mean, it was it quite some time. It way through the 90s, right? Yeah. It was a good, I mean, a good run of 20 years or so. When you I, that's, yeah, that's what I thought. I, I wanted to ask you this. Um, you've got the famous people coming in. Uh, maybe you've got some of the obscure people um, that come in, but was there anyone whether you interviewed them or yeah i guess someone that you interviewed or some that you saw come in and be interviewed that was a quote unquote a no one then but ended up being like huge or 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 big bigger than you thought they were at the time bon jovi mm. really we got a call from a woman named karen gordon she's a broadcaster on cbc um, wonderful person. And she was a promo rep for Polygram Records at the time. And she called me and I was doing the all night show. So the, this is the city limit show. She's like, I got this band in town. Nobody knows who they are. Nobody cares. They haven't sold any records. They're playing at the Elma combo. 20 people are going to show up. Would you have them on your show? <laughs> I'm like, Karen, for you. Absolutely. <laughs> Talk about like the worst pitch in the world. Yeah. Right? 
There's five really good reasons to say no to this idea. But we said yes, of course, because, you know, we were so desperate to have talent on the show. So originally it was just going to be John, I think, who came down. But then the whole band were like, no, no, we want to go. We all want to be. So oh, they all came down to the show. And uh, this is the City Limits show. So, you know, it was not like a well-known show. Like they never would have seen it before because no. they were from New Jersey. Anyway. They came down and it was a real sort of rock and fun time and there's lots of goofing off and they were, you know, zooming around like at one point they poured a beer into a woman's shoe and they were drinking. I mean, it was just like rock and roll bad boy behavior, right? So we, but we loved it and we were, you know, glad to have them and we thanked them for coming and they were like, oh, thank you so much for having us and everything else. Four years later, they sell 11 million copies of Slippery When Wet. And they come back to town, they're playing the gardens, and they're only going to do one show. Who are you going to call, right? Mm, wow. So they came down and we had a barbecue. <laughs> this is typically the way that we treated big stars, right? It's like you want to give them the, the, you know, the royal treatment and the interview set and everything else, make it sound good and look good. It's like, no, I don't think so. I think we'll just barbecue. And they wanted to do the barbecuing. So it was, and we did it up on the ledge. And if you remember what the parking lot scene yeah. was like, yeah. kids were all down below. And the, the bunch of you guys would always come over and go, hey, how's it going? And, it, you know, it was that there's the perfect example of a band that was nothing and then or something. And four years later, that's not like, you know, a couple of months later, our song hits. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm estimating. I think it was four years. Yeah, that's a, and they remembered you. Oh yeah, if that had been they, for them. The all night show was big deal. Wow, <laughs> go figure, right? <laughs> that's awesome. That is nuts. That's a great story. Thank you so much for that. Oh, um, could, as I say, it's fun to share these things. You know. Yeah. Mm. You, I, I'm going to throw one out there. Um, I don't know if you have a story or not, but Greg will tell you um that my favorite artist is neil young ah um yeah do you have a neil young story yeah i do oh. so it starts with paul mccartney okay <laughs> so mccartney was getting ready to tour uh they were going to call the tour flowers in the dirt i think and this was in 1989 and he hadn't toured in hmm, i don't know at least 12 years maybe 14 years or so so they sent me to London and we went down to the, um, the rehearsal space, which was this gigantic like airplane hangar size the BBC studios. And so, you know, I did my interview with McCartney one-on-one, -on -one, which was just like, you know, unbelievable. And then we, then they did, they put us on a couch. So there was my camera person, myself, and Nick Jennings, who's a well-known Canadian journalist. Uh, and we were the only people in the room, aside from the crew. And they did the full show, beginning to end, full production, full lights. He was doing the jokes between the songs. I mean, it was all, yeah, right? And um, so that was that. And then, you know, at the end of the day, we were just so stoked from having done this that we went out and we got, you know, drank a bunch of beer and ate Indian food in London and went back to the hotel room and there was a message for me. And this was like at, you know, two in the morning or something. It's like, uh, yeah, Christopher, it's Michael Hayden. Um, you're not going to be coming home. You're flying to Los Angeles tomorrow instead of coming home and you're going to interview Neil Young. And you're going to be, by the way, you're doing the EPK, which was the electronic press kit meaning that they use your questions and they plug in the, his answers with different broadcasters, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> that sounds good. Can I hear the music? Yeah, there'll be like, a, you know, a disc or whatever it was in 1989 or a, or a cassette, whatever it was, waiting for you in your hotel room and then, you, then you'll head over to his manager's place. So that was good. But when we got there, Neil did the thing that no artist ever does. He was early. <laughs> he he wow. just, the cameraman literally had not even pulled his, you know, rig out of the box and then much less set up his camera. And Neil just comes in and sits down. And if you've ever seen him like close up, he's intense. Yeah. He's got this like 
forehead with these eyebrows that just like look like the edge of a cliff staring at you, you know, and the eyes like look like, like a train tunnel. I mean, he is intense. And I thought, I'm in trouble because I have to talk to him now because he's sitting right opposite me, chair to chair, knee to knee. But I can't ask him anything about what we're going to do in the interview or he'll go, well, like I said, and, and that's, that's what happens because the artists don't think, oh, I need to repeat what I said before so that this person can have it for their interview. No. And so I thought, well, what oh, am I wow. going to do? And then I remembered that we both had gone to high school in Winnipeg and that we had both gone to the same school at different times. And I said, hey, you, uh, you went to Calvin, didn't you? He's like, yeah. Did you? And I went, yeah, I did. I said, do you remember that math teacher, Mr. Kerr? He's like, oh, that bald bastard with the <laughs> screen that he scared the living but Jesus out of me. And then we were off. We were talking about all the teachers at Kelvin High School that we'd known. Meanwhile, Basil got his camera rig set up and started rolling off the end of that. And that's my Neil Young story. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That is, a, did you, do you remember the album? Freedom. Oh. Yeah, Rock and Free World. Yeah. Was this. yeah. And it was a big record for him. It was a, it was a comeback record for him, is in fact. Yeah. I, I think the only Grammy he's ever won was uh, Rock's. No, no, he didn't win a Grammy on that one. Yeah, he won it uh, for Illinois. Sorry. Um, that is an awesome story, though. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah. I, the other, there's, there's another little tag into this. I, I used to. Um, make all my notes on three and a half by five cards. If you ever see me in an interview, you'll notice I've got them in my hand. <clears throat> and I didn't mind because I was like very at ease with them. And, you know, I just, I just would, would I, once I knew the, the camera was on the subject, then I could take that moment and just duck my eyes down and catch what I needed to catch for the next question or whatever. And at one point, Neil leans over, <laughs> he looks at the cards and he goes, I wish I had all my answers written on little cards like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I think you'd come off a little overprepared, but you know, <laughs> he laughed. So it's moments like that, that, you know, make it all worthwhile. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Uh, I have to ask you, uh, as someone who lives in Scarborough, um one of the uh wait i don't live in scarborough you have a a good friend of yours that lived in scarborough at one yeah. uh mike mike myers yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> totally we're not worthy we're not worth um how 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 is that um he comes on your show does the Wayne's World, Wayne Campbell, uh, shtick, and goes on to cre create a, a, a career uh, from that. How, how, how did that, how did that actually start? You guys were friends growing up, yeah? Or not growing we, up, but you guys were friends from before. Yeah, we met, uh, we were both in the Second City Touring Company. That's, that's right. And Mike used to do Wayne in the improv section. Um, and I think he said it was basically, it was, it was something he would do at parties to get girls to laugh. So um, so when I got the all night show, and we, we used to hang out all the time, we were friends. And and, and I said, do you wanna come do Wayne on the, on the show? He's like, yeah, that'd be great. So we discussed it before and we figured, well, the premise would be that he was my cousin and that he'd like covered my ass in a fight or something and that I owed him. So I, he, that's what, that was the premise on which he got to come down. He was collecting on his debt and coming down to be on the show. So it's all very awkward and he, you know, we don't want him on the show and he's, he's causing havoc, of course. But um, he, yeah, that was the first time that Wayne had been on television. Hmm. It was City Limits. So are you Garth? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I hope Just not really. <laughs> uh, that that is awesome. So uh, so one of the questions that we like to ask our guests before we wrap things up is, 
Um, what's in your ears lately? What are you listening to that people should be checking out? I have been on a binge of buying uh, vinyl versions of old jazz albums. Mm. So I've been digging a lot of Bill Evans records, um, uh, some some of the Coltrane reissues, uh, some of the Chet Baker stuff. I mean, I, I love that music. That's that's I listen to that more than anything else. Um, but I'm thinking in terms of pop stuff. Uh, no, it's really what you're what you're. The question is really what you're listening to now. So I yeah, that. thanks. Yeah. yeah, and those records, they just sound so great. Like I listened to um, Lullaby of Birdland, the album by Sarah Vaughan, and I mean. I saw her perform at the end, towards the end of her life, and she was just one of the most beautiful live singers that I'd ever heard. She had the, it's almost like she had a second voice that was like an, an octave below the one that was normally put to use. And uh, you hear the records and there's that, there's that, it's like stroking you, you know? Mm -hmm. And I got a little, I called my vinyl room over here. <laughs> It's uh, in fact the reason I, I think I was a little bit late for you guys because I I'd had an accident. There was a bit of a spill in aisle three where the vinyl on top in just aisle slowly, three <laughs> slowly tipped over. <laughs> There's no, I'm joking. That's just a grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> but the the vinyl tipped over and went over the edge, and I was like, ah, you know, trying to save it. So that is awesome. Christopher Ward, this this has been an absolute delight. Thank you for our honor taking the time to to chat with a uh, a Scarborough and a Danforth kid. Uh, this this has been great. Kareem, you and Greg are the best. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You made me feel very welcome. Oh, thank you. If thank people you. want to check out your music, your books, your podcast, where's where's the best place for them? ChristopherWard.ca. Awesome. Yeah. ChristopherWard.ca. Christopher, again, thank you so much. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Thanks, guys.